I missed a little horse. I had some some um, questions yet. If they didn't, if they want these brothers to take and preach, I'd be glad. I don't get excited. This is not a. This is just some prayer cloths going to Africa. And this is all to be cut off in prayer cloths and want me to pray over it out here tonight. Plus some envelopes full. And I thought we'd just uh, dedicate all this to the to the Lord. This is all to be cut up to go before me to Africa. <laughs> Now, you know how many prayer calls that's going to make when they're just about that big a piece? Thousands of them. Amen. Brother Fred brought 700 the other day in a little envelope about like that. And you can imagine what this, how many of this will go to make. So we're just in a little bit while we pray over it. Now, I'm just a little hoarse, but I said that I would be back to answer some of these, these questions the best that I could. And I... Always when these revivals comes along, it starts a little stirring. And I um, uh, won't, thought maybe this is kind of even it off tonight with the church, you know. Because sometimes something might have been said that the church didn't understand it. And they give you a chance to write your own question now. I'll give you the ones that I got. And then if you've got anything uh, like it, you won't have to write it. And then one of them is, please explain Romans 7.25. Next one, you said a person could live so close to God that he did not sin. Uh, what likeness will we be in the resurrection? Brother Branham, what must a person do when they have followed all the instructions that you have taught? And then how do you receive the Holy Ghost? Please explain Hebrews 6 and 4 and compare it with Hebrews 10, 26. And uh, what is meant by predestination before the foundation of the world and where in the Bible would you find such as that? And uh, Sister McCartney, no, that's, that's a prayer request. Now that's our questions that we have for uh, tonight. If you have another, while we're just having a little preliminary here while you bring it up and we just try now if there's any question in the church's mind concerning anything that uh, that we have while well, we'd just like to um, to be able to to help you the best that we know how see and I want you to always remember that what that I say here I don't say that's emphatically the truth and everything it's the best that I know to be the emphatic truth of it. I, I could be wrong just like any other mortal. But I just, uh, Brother Jackson just tried to explain it the way that I think is right. You see, the way I see it, Brother Mike, in the Bible, just uh, and studying these things, I just don't take it from one place. I, I go back and bring it out of Genesis and bring it through the Revelations, right? Straight through the Bible. And then... You could bring the, even the subject through, but if it didn't coincide with the rest of it in there, the rest of the scripture, then it would be wrong anyhow. If you brought it anywhere, it's got to, it's got to fit with all the rest of the scriptures, you see. And all scripture will fit together if it's rightly put together. It, it's just like a big jigsaw puzzle. I don't mean, if I'm saying wrong, and God forgive me, the scripture is something likened to a jigsaw puzzle. See, that it's all broke up, just mixed up in a box. And it takes the Holy Spirit to place that together, see. And, and we cannot do it. Now, there's no 969 different interpretations to it because the Bible said the Scripture is of no private interpretation. It's just the way it's written. We just believe it to... Thank you, Brother Pat. We, um, it's just the way it's, uh, it's written in the Bible that's the way that we have to take it like that. So if we try to make it say something here, well, it won't say the same thing over here then. See, if we, if we put, you've got to make the scripture answer itself here, answer itself here, answer itself here. Just each one go right into its place to make it all fit together. And now, <clears throat> I thought maybe I was going to speak and said that I would tonight. We have seen his star in the east. 
and have come to worship him. But I just don't have enough voice and then to do that. I got hot here one night, went out. And I was so hot when I got in the car, just smoked it right up. I run the window down and went home. Well, the, I think that was a Thursday or Friday night. The very next night, I started getting, the day I started getting a little hoarse. Kind of a, or it's, I don't, not sick, no fever, no sickness, no cold, but it's just like a, like a laryngitis in your throat, just from speaking and, and injuring by preaching hard, and then, and then it got cold. But it'll, it'll be all right. And another day or two, maybe by Sunday, I might come down to help Brother again after he gets through his preaching. I'll I'll search around and see what else is left. And uh, and then uh, I want all the church to receive the Holy Ghost. And my daughter-in-law sitting here, not because she's my daughter-in-law, not because it's here. She's one of the finest girls that I know of. She's a dandy girl, Lois. And she's come up out of great things from her background where she had to come out of a family who didn't worship God and so forth. I feel sorry for the child. Have to come up like that. And now she's seeking the Holy Ghost and fasted till she can't hardly stand up. Fasting and praying for the Holy Ghost. My sister, Dolores, she said, Bill, I just, when the church's power was in the church, she said, I just felt like I could fly away. And then when everybody, the Holy Ghost began to fall on people, so I just sat there and looked around. See? Well, the, and that question's in here tonight on that. So I thought maybe that might help the church Amen. To, to receive. And now, I don't want to take a Wednesday night prayer meeting and break it up into something like that. But uh, I want to be sure that the church thoroughly understands these things, you see, before. And I was just talking to uh, a doctor here Sunday came back in the back of the church here and uh, back here in the in the back of the church is a medical doctor. He drove all the way from um, Warriors Assembly got headquarters at now in Springfield, Missouri, to uh, attend the meeting. And he said, Brad Bram, now that's from the assembly's headquarters, and he said, All my life I've wondered about that since the first time I was ever settled on it in my life. He said Met me back there in the room, some um, uh, medical doctor. And um, and so Brother Mercer and Brother Gene Gold back there with the recorder just now, Brother Mercer said he got the best out of the meeting and were explained that the, when that Holy Spirit came into the meeting and, and broke itself up, God dividing himself amongst his people. Well, that's just what it does. And then when God's people begins to gather back together, there's unity, there's power. See? And whenever God's people gets together completely, I believe the resurrection will take place. And there'll be a rapture in time when the Holy Spirit begins to gather it up. It'll be in the minority, of course, but there will be a great gathering. Now, these prayer clause is sent the voice of healing. Um, uh, right immediately the first of the year, if the Lord willing, uh, I'm going into Kingston, Jamaica, into Haiti's, and, and from there, the, the president of Haiti sent me an invitation uh, with, uh, with all their militia for protection. They're having an uprise there. And uh, what it is, he wants us to come with this type of ministry, which he'd heard had been over in, in uh, San Juan last year when we was there. He said he thought that was the only thing that would save his country. Uh, See, now, if I have a Catholic friend sitting here, I don't say this for to insult you or anything. I don't mean it in that way. But the Catholic Church is trying to take over Hades. See, and the only thing that will save it will be a Protestant shaking revival right now. See, and it was real nice, and I appreciate it. And... Uh, so I told him during Christmas week, the next few days now, after tomorrow, we'll go kind of fasting and praying and, and seeing which way the Lord will lead us. And then South America, and then I do feel definitely led to go to, to uh, Norway. I miss definitely led to go to Norway this year. And then Africa also. And this is being going to be cut into small ribbons and sent into Africa ahead of the meeting. That's how many people you can get a general idea how many people's calling for prayer calls now when you hear you're coming over see just get get in contact again 
So these are little closets cut up also and ready to be sent out to, to different people. So together with this great church of the living God, let's bow our heads just a moment now. And each of you in your own way, pray for God to anoint these cloths. Now, first I quote the scripture that from the body of Paul, they taken handkerchiefs or aprons and placed them upon the sick and evil spirits went out of the people in afflictions and they were healed. Lord, upon this little desk that's been sitting here for all these years and how that you have blessed us so much and and the gospel has constantly went across this and if this little desk could only have eyes or could talk it could tell of hundreds of great miracles that's been performed right before it crippled lame blind cancer ridden and the powers of the living God has been made known into this little building. And Father God, we just thank Thee for all these things. And now the church has assembled together tonight to worship You. We've come for to answer questions that's been asked. It's the sincerity and the hearts of the people that these things puzzle them in their mind. And Lord, we do realize that if anything is puzzling us, we can never have faith as long as there is a question. So we do not want any questions. Lord, we see the need of the baptism of the Holy Ghost among our people and among this church. And we, we don't want any questions in their mind. We want it all cleared up so that they'll know what it is when it comes and know that it's far then. And then across the sea, way yonder into those dark jungles where the drums are beating and lepers are laying all around in the under the trees and the flies are blowing and the and their legs off and their ears eat off and their faces eat up. Leprosy stench, Lord, till you can hardly come within a city block of them, and poor little children without food, without clothes, and they love me, Lord, and they they have believed the ministry after the power of the living God did heal so many of them. And I haven't had rest in my spirit since the day I left Africa, knowing that them poor, dejected people are in that terrible condition there and living in superstitious conditions and the witch doctor with human bones beating them in his fingers and calling on the evil spirits and oh what a what a place and then to think here in America lovely churches and big places and God and to know that those poor people are so needy See them come to the meeting, lay one on top of the other, and many of them die laying there, just trying to hear a few words from someone that they have said that knows you. Their hearts has begun rising, Lord, since the message and the letters is sweeping across Africa now. Fires look like are begin to be kindled again. And your great church there, which was a mighty church, broken to pieces. Oh, God, and separated one in more of the faculty of the formal and, and the other still trying to hold to the truth and the spirit. And now thousands are sending in now. They want prayer clause quickly. That's I've prayed over. In these little uh, envelopes here are our prayer requests, uh, little parcels that's going to the needy. O oh, God of heaven who made the heavens and earth, I pray thee, Lord, in Jesus' name that you'll sanctify every stitch of this goods. And may your Holy Spirit go with every stitch of it, Lord, and when it's laid upon the sick and the afflicted, may the evil spirits leave them. 
thinking back in those jungles where these things will go, many of them, where they even worship the devil. I pray, God, that he'll not have one place to stand, that he'll leave the camps and the people will be brought to a knowledge of the Lord Jesus. Grant it, Lord, may their sicknesses be healed, their troubles mended, and their souls saved, and the power of God have preeminences. Grant it, Father. We send every stitch of this good as one unit. Many little licks of fire is in here tonight, Lord. And together we send our prayers to you in behalf of this, that every person will be healed that it's laid upon. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Now, can you hear me in the back pretty well back there now tonight? That's fine. I think we'll be so happy when we get another church here because these little things holding down chop up your voice and you, you can't hear it hardly at all. I realize again tonight I, I'm approaching uh, grounds. Brother Woods, before I forget it, I've got that handkerchief. Didn't you give me a handkerchief for someone or was it you? Somebody give me a handkerchief. To put in my pocket and wear. And I've had it ever since during the meeting. I don't know who it was. I thought it was you. you said, wear this in your pocket for somebody. Uh, I some. Gave you a handkerchief to, uh, that it was for Brother Jackson back I believe I gave you a handkerchief. Was that it, Brother Jackson? Did you have a handkerchief for someone? I gave him one to give me a This is it. All right. Well, this. I guess I picked the wrong one up all the time. <laughs> Well, this will be right here, Brother Jackson, if you wish it. And um, now I know somebody give it to me and said, wear it in your pocket. And then I'd put it in my coat and forgotten about it. Now, to now, if the Lord willing, and my voice is all right, either Sunday morning or Sunday night, one, the Lord willing, I want to speak on the Christmas message that I have for you. The, the infallible sign, you see. I still, I struck it Sunday morning and something hit fire in my heart and I just was too far along with the message to pick it up again. So uh, I want to pick it up Sunday morning, the Lord willing, or Sunday night one. So Brother Neville and I'll get together on that time. Now, as Brother Neville has said, and so do I, want to thank each one of you for the memories of Christmas, your card, Brother and Sister Spencer, I got yours and all the different ones here that sent me your cards around. I do appreciate them and the gifts and things that you sent. We certainly do appreciate it from my wife and I and, we and the children. We thank you. We would like to be able to send a Christmas present to everyone. But that sure would be a hard thing for a preacher to do. It. <laughs> or maybe around as many as there is to go to I just wouldn't be able to do it you see I just uh, but I wish I could even get the kiddies everyone something I'd sure like to do it but it's not just ministers can't do that there's just too many to go by but we're all I'm sure myself and others too that we appreciate our congregations one of the greatest things that I think that you've done is your love and your undying faith that you have placed in me as your one of your pastors here and this year brother neville that's to you too my dear brother and the fine spirit that brother neville has always showed like come right ahead brother brown here's the pulpit take it right over bless god i like to sit down listening i i like that i just like that humble unselfish way that brother neville has and your all's faith and just one thing you can do me a favor by is pray for me. I'm going to have a bunch of spotted meetings uh, just before the big itinerary starts. Now, 
They'll, they'll be placed around, I think, down around Glasgow, Kentucky, I'll have a night. Maybe Camelsville, Kentucky, I'll have a night. And, and uh, over at uh, some other place there in Kentucky, Willow Shade, I believe it is, uh, I have a night. Or just so long like I'll let you know just as soon as we get them straightened out of uh, the meetings that's coming up, which will be just little spotted meetings now until I go back into the field again. But I dedicated myself freshly and newly the other night to God. And by God's help and by God's grace, I mean to stay in the harness till I die. See, I did that around 30 years ago. And I've been in. But I get so tired sometimes, I get beyond myself. I just get to a place where I just can't go any farther. See, you all just merely see it right here. <laughs> you just don't realize what it is up there and out yonder and over here and... and not even from one, not from one city, no, one state, no, not from the United States, but the world, see, yeah. around the world, see, and that, that's many, I guess, in contact tonight, I have met or contacted, m not into thousands, but millions of people, see, yeah. and you'd just be surprised how many of those are sick, see, and they're calling, and it does make a great pressure. So I appreciate your all's prayers, and by God's help and grace, a very Merry Christmas to every one of you. Remember my saying, this is not Santa Claus, this is for Jesus, you see. Christmas means Christ. Amen. And um, we were riding last night, showing the kiddies all the houses decorated and everything, which is awful nice. But I thought if I ever had on anything on my house that I ever wanted to write, it would be a neon sign. Um... Uh, trusting Christ will be in your Christmas. <laughs> That's right. Put Christ back in the Christmas. Now, Father God, we're approaching the questions now. Very, very sincerely we come. And these precious people, Lord, has relayed these questions and it's on their hearts and maybe many more in the building. And they're wanting to know just what to do. Father, uh, I'm a very poor substitute for you, but I pray that you'll help me to know your word, that it will bring a satisfying potion to every question. This then we leave in your hands, and in your name we ask it. Amen. Now, Brother Pat's question here is a very, very good one. <laughs> I just might start off on that, Brother Pat. Now, if any of the rest of you have a question, uh, uh, you just write it and put it up here, or, or Brother Pat will bring you a piece of paper if you don't have a piece of paper, or I'd just be glad to do the best I could to answer it. Now, this is quite a... A uh, question, Brother Pat. This sounds like it's a sense of humor, <laughs> but it's a question. Where are the spirits now that went into the swine? <laughs> Where are the spirits that went into that hurt swine that day when Jesus cast them out of the maniac? Well, Brother Pat, to the best of my knowledge, now, we're starting off on demonology to start with. Now, demonology is a great thing. Now, some of you watch the clock and don't let me go too long on one question. But those demon powers, those spirits, was in a man called Legion first. Isn't that right? And because his name was Legion, because Legion in the Hebrew means many. See, there were many of those. And those spirits that was in that dear man had drove him insane. And if anyone ever seen an insane person or had to deal with them, there are many times their, their, their strength. Because they are so possessed of the devil. If you was ever around where a, a person lost their mind, or oh, it takes several good men to hold them, and they're twice or three times their power. 
Now, when a person is crippled and the Holy Spirit gets a hold of them, if the devil's got that much power to make a man three or four times his human strength, how much power can God put in a man? See? That's what comes up on him to make him walk in the strength of God where he's been laying crippled for years. His bones come out straight. His hands go straight. He walks in like a young new man because the power of the Holy Spirit is on him. Now, these was so evil until they wrapped the man in chains and he could break them. And they said he plucked them asunder. And there was no, nothing could bind him. He was really a real bad case because he had a legion of demons in him. And then when he, Jesus crossed over and come into Gadaria and started down by the tombs and he was so evil, not the man. See, the man was all right. It's not the man. When you see a person like that, don't never think it, it's the man. It's the devil that's in the man. Yes. Amen. Now, that maniac on the platform that night was going to kill me at, up in Oregon. That man, I, when I come to me, instead of him spitting in my face and calling me a snake in the grass before uh, nearly 10,000 people, well, it wasn't... That it wasn't the man. He's a man that eats, drinks, sleeps, perhaps with a family and loves and, and just like I am or you are. But it was that devil in him that was doing that. See? And you never cast a devil out by the wrong attitude. It takes love to do that. And love is the most powerful force that there is in the world. Now, if you notice... A devil is always hate. Hate is of the devil. And when people hate someone, remember, it is a terrible devil to despise or dislike. You mustn't do that. You remember that the, the de Jesus said in his sermon that when you pray our Father who art in heaven, and when He come down, He said, if you don't from your heart forgive every man his trespasses, neither does your heavenly Father forgive you your trespasses. See? You mustn't do that. But now where the devil creates a power of hatred, see, to run out on the platform to kill me, which he physically he was more than able. Many times more. He could have helped me up perhaps in his two fingers right up to the belt like that because he weighed 260 or 270 is better than six foot and a half or seven foot tall. Great big fella. And this, he just hit a preacher down the street with his fist, broke his collarbone, jaw, and injured him and put him in a hospital. He just hated preachers. And then he just run right up there to kill me. See, Now, in that man, was some of these spirits that was cast out of the swine in Gadaria. Some of those poor people are out here in the insane institution beating their heads against padded bars, cells. Remember, devils never die. Ne devils always live. But there will be a time where devils will have to die. They will become totally annihilated. But now they're alive. And they work from generation to generation upon human beings. Some of them is in the form of cancer. Some is in the form of epilepsy. Some is in the form of tuberculosis. They get into the flesh. But seemingly they are powerless until they can get into a person. They have to operate through a person. Which brings to another thought that the Holy Spirit is covers the earth but it is almost helpless until it gets into you and to me. 
God is depending on you and I. Amen. See? The Holy Spirit, the earth is full of the Spirit of God. But it's poured out. But it, it cannot operate until it comes into us, we human beings, to operate. And the devil wants to take us over to operate under him. So when he gets a mild form, he starts in sin. If he can hold him just in a righteous man, a good man, just let him go ahead and try to be good like that. If he can hold him like that until he's dead, that's just what he wants to do. He's got him. Because no matter how righteous you are, how good you are, how moral you are, how clean you are, how honest you are, you'll never get to heaven until you're born again. Amen. Jesus Amen. said so. So there's no, it, you've got to be born, you've got to be regenerated, or there's not a way in the world for you to ever enter heaven, or ever, or ever come to Christ. Now, I said a few moments ago, which may rise into your thinking, another question that, I, that I've taught, and that is on, on, I do not believe that there is an eternal, I don't believe the Bible teaches an eternal burning hell. It doesn't. Because if hell is eternal and people that go there will be punished eternally, the only way they could be eternally punished, they'd have to have eternal life. And there's only one form of eternal life and that's in God. See, so they have to come to annihilation. See, that is their physical part becomes annihilated and then their spiritual part becomes annihilated. That's completely consumed. There's no more to it. Neither root nor branch, the Bible calls it. They are completely done away. And then I can prove that there is degrees in heaven. That they'll not all be on the same equal. But you'll have equal eternal life. But the Bible said that the kings of the earth bring their honor and glory. Revelation 22. Bring their honor and glory into the city. That proves that there'll be kings in the new earth. Kings and rulers. Jesus told his disciples. They said, what will we have after we have left father and mother and all to follow you? He said, Verily I say unto you, you'll set up on twelve thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel in that day. See, it's another, it's an earthly system that's coming up that'll, that'll be far supreme to anything in that there'll be no sin. But yet they'll have rulers and so forth in the cities when everything will be carried on in the way of eternal life. But the wicked shall be punished for their sins according to the deeds that's done in the body and then will become completely and totally annihilated. I just remember that. You just taking down notes. Remember that. You put me on record that, that there's only one form of eternal life and we're seeking for that and God alone has eternal life. There's no two types of eternal life. One, eternal life. And that's all that lives. And remember, put this on your note too. Everything that has been made that had a beginning has an end. Everything that had a beginning has an end and only that that had no beginning has no end. And there's only one thing that never had a beginning, and that was God. And that's the only way you can rise in the resurrection is to have that eternal life within you. See, that's the only way that you ever come back. Is something that had no beginning. And when you have received the Holy Spirit in you dwells a life that never did start and never can end, and you possess that life in you, then you've got eternal life and are sons and daughters of God. See? And you can no more die than God can die. Because you are a part of God. 
They got the question here a while ago to, uh, in here somewhere of predestination. Brings it right to that same thing. You come a part of God. And if God divided Himself in that great pillar of fire, and those little licks went out over each one of those persons, and it does yet the same thing today, we can prove it by the experience that we have, by the teachings of the Bible, by a scientific research picture to show that's that, that God divides Himself among His people and because I live, ye live also. Amen. Jesus said. We cannot die. There's no such a thing as death to a Christian. For he that believeth on me, though he were dead, yet shall he live, and whosoever liveth and believeth on me shall never die. Amen. See, die, the word death means separated. Now, physically, we separate from our physical sight because that's still sin. But our spirits is of God that can never be separated from God because we are a part of God. We are, we are bringing, uh, we are brought back into that a thought of God. Everything that God does is perfect and eternal. And when God's very thoughts went out for a kingdom of people who would worship Him, them very thoughts is eternal. See? They can no more perish. Every word of God is eternal. Jesus said, heavens and earth will pass away. Both heavens and earth may pass away, but my words will never pass away. Amen. See? They're eternal with God. And if ye abide me and my word in you, see, we become a part of His word, part of His life for we are flesh of His flesh and bone of His bone and life of His life, then we can no more perish than God Himself could perish. That's what the Holy Ghost is. A little fellow's left here from Georgia, Brother Evans. He's been everywhere across the country. And he's a great supporter of my good friend, Oral Roberts. And he, he supported all of his television cast down in there and a lot of things he did. But he said to me the other day, he said, Brother Branham, I went over to Brother Jagger's school. I went everywhere. I stayed out there for three months. I was hunting. I went to the places, each one of them, and bring it back to the same thing. I could never get a place where I had any assurance. You see, if I do this or if I do that, and what might I do here, or am I or am I not? said, till I heard your teachings. said, then that settled it once for all. For the worshiper once purged from his sins has no more conscience of sin. He's passed from death unto life and he's got eternal life inside of him dwelling there and can no more die than God can die. Amen. Exactly the Bible. He's eternally taken care of because he's got eternal life. Now, that don't mean that you can sin and get by with it. For when you sin, you're punished for your sins. Exactly right. But as long as eternal life is in there, you live forever. Jesus said, He that heareth my words, St. John 5, 24, He that heareth my words, believeth on him it sent me, has everlasting life and shall never come to the judgment, but has passed from death unto life. See, all, no man can come to me except my Father draws him first. And all that comes to me, I, and all that my Father has given me, will come to me. Amen. That's right. All that He has given will come, and none of them will be lost. I'll give Him eternal life, and will raise Him up at the last days. Amen. St. John 6. Oh, what a blessed assurance. Hallelujah. See? Then you don't have to go about... Scared to death and wondering, Amen. God has given us the perfect assurance that we are His children. Amen. And as His children, He corrects us. Amen. Just like I correct my children. You correct your children. When they're wrong, we correct them. If, if my uh, children does wrong, then it's my duty as a father to correct them. 
And then if God's children does wrong, it's his duty as a father and he will correct you. Amen. Just remember that. You'll be corrected. But as long as you're his child, the world better keep their hands off of you. That's right. For he said, it's far better for you that a millstone was hanged at your neck and you were drowned in the depths of the sea than even to bring an offense up on one of these little ones that believe in me. That's right. What is that judgment going to be? Now, Brother Pat, back to your question. The spirits that went out of that man that drove him like a maniac, see, does the same thing today in people, see. It's them spirits. Thousands times thousands. And the devil comes in with just like a, a little opium. It's just like they take a little schoolgirl. The first thing they'll do is get her to smoke a cigarette. See? That gets her started. And the next thing they do, they get a little stronger. Then the first thing, it ends up into marijuana. Uh, and then from that on into the real dope habit. What does it do? It drives them insane. They just go crazy and the devil's got them. See, so the devil is in smoking cigarettes. That's his little mild form. Now, if he sees you're pretty smart and go to catch that, he'll never let it go any farther than cigarettes. See? As long as he can just hold you there alone enough that he can take, get your life snapped out because he knows that you can't go until God has said so, but you'll hear sermon after sermon, message after message, and punch after punch on it, and warning after warning on it. And if he can just keep your war off and keep your mind on something else of being a popular person or you've got to have it or something like that, then he can just hold you there until he gets you out. Or if he can just let you join church and say, I'm going to be a good fellow. I'm going to turn a new page. I'm going to get, I'm going up to church and join church. If he can just keep you under that, that's all he has to do. He's got you yet because you, Jesus said, verily, verily, that's absolutely, absolutely, I say unto you, except the man be born of the water and of the spirit, he will in no wise enter the kingdom. Let me show you something. I was talking to a brother this afternoon, Brother Wood. When we were on a journey, just out to try to relax my mind, keep from talking to get enough voice to talk tonight. Now, notice, we are going down here and get a nice big grain of corn. It's the most perfect grain of corn there is in the country. And I'm going to, well, corn or ear, whatever you want to call it. I'll, I'll take it over here to the Clark County Fair. And I'll win a blue ribbon on it. It's the best grain of corn, the most perfect corn there is ever seen. I get a blue ribbon on it, I'll take it down to the Floyd County. I'll take it on to the Harrison County. I'll take it to the state. And I'll take it to the nation. And it wins every blue ribbon. It's the most perfect grain of corn. And the scientists with their great glasses, they look through it and they examine it. See, the it's a perfect amount of potash and a perfect amount of calcium and, and a perfect moisture, everything it goes in that grain of corn is just exactly perfect. Now, you say, I'm going to plant that and get me another perfect grain out of it. And you plant that in the ground, unless that corn, that perfect grain has the germ of life in it, it'll lay there and rot and that's the end of it. It'll never rise again. No matter how perfect it is, it's, it'll never rise until it's germatized with a new life in it. And you can take a man. Uh, I don't mean this to hurt feelings. I just This is church. This is my tabernacle. and I'm as free as a bird. See? Now, I want you to remember that in this, that a man can be good. He can pay his tithes. He can be honest. He can help the widow. He can help the orphan. He can be a church member. You can't find one flaw about that man. Every time something's to come up right down in his pocket and get the last penny he had and give to the poor, he'll, he'll stand by you through thick and thin. He'll be your buddy when even a lot of the so-called others will turn you down and everything like that. And that man is still outside the kingdom of God. Unless He's been filled with the Holy Ghost. Eternal life. Amen. That's right. That's how important it is. 
That's the reason I'm trying to get my church to see this. And I, I pray that you don't think I'm just trying to act smart about it. I, I'm trying to tell you that the devil is so deceiving. That he's so deceiving till he'll, he'll make you act like a Christian. He'll do something and impersonate Christ right down to the very elect, the Bible said, they'd be so close together. You'll be a good man. You'll have, now look here, let me show you examples to be sure. Now we want to keep it in the scriptures while we're on these spirits. Esau was a far better man in every way you wanted to take it than Jacob was. Now, Esau, God forgive me for this remark, he was just a little sneaker, that's all. Now, if you notice him, what was he? A little tattletale and a big liar. Now, if I'm saying wrong, God forgive me, but he did lie and a cheat. There never was one like him, hardly. When he took them speckled sticks even and put them in the water to cause those pregnated cattle and sheep over there to bring forth speckled sheep. And speckled cattle. To get him on his own own hands. What did he do? He put Esau's coat on him in a piece of sheepskin and everything else that went up there and impersonated Esau before his blind father, which was a prophet. Is that right? Why he was a little shyster. He really was. And Esau was a I ought, maybe I oughtn't have said it that way. See, I don't mean it that way. I, I'll take that back. He, he was, he, he was a, I don't know, you know what he was. See, you just think in your mind. I, he, was a, he was a great man of God, and I don't want to say nothing bad about him, you see. But I'm just trying to point out little, little things that he did. Just look how sneaking he was. Liar? Sure. He was just, he was terrible. But what was he trying to do? Look at Esau. Esau was a good man. Moral, a good church member today. What did he do? He was a hunter. He went out. Of course, that, that's how they made their living. He'd taken care of the herds for his father. His daddy was blind. A prophet. A prophet of the Lord was blind. And deceived by his own son. A prophet. Isaac, through him come Christ. You can call him prophet. The Bible said he was. Amen. And was blind. Why didn't he heal himself? And why didn't he know that that was Esau? And that was Jacob instead of Esau? See, God don't tell his prophets everything. He just tells them what he wants them to know. See, God was working out a plan then and he had to work in it. God, will, if you'll submit yourself to God, God will make you work right into his plan. Now, Notice what he did, what this fellow did. Esau went out and tried to take care of his poor old blind daddy. And Jacob seemingly, he didn't care what happened to him. But there's one thing Jacob wanted. That was the birthright. Amen. Regardless of what come, how he had to get it, what level he had to come on, that birthright was all he cared for. And Esau, the Bible said, despised his birthright. The Bible said that. And the Bible said, except there comes some vain fornicator among you, like that evil person Esau, who despised his birthright and sold it for a mess of pottage. Now, what is a birthright? It's the rights. That's what I'm trying to tell you now. This Holy Spirit is your birthright. That's your birthright. That's your God-given right. Now, people say today, I'll go to church. I'm just as good as the next fella. But me, act like one of them holy rollers. Not me. Well, you Esau. See? It's just the same thing. Amen. Despising the birthright. Why, well, he swapped it for a mess of pottage. And... You sell it, I don't say you, but the world sells it for a lot less than that. Esau was hungry. But you see, if goodness would be counted, 
If somebody, if we walked up there and stayed in around the tent for a, a few days, we'd find out that Esau was, we'd have picked Esau. See? But in his heart, he wanted that birthright. He didn't care about anything else. He wanted that birthright. That's all he wanted. And Esau wanted to be a nice fellow and take care of everything and do everything just right and make everything just a, He was a real good legalist. <laughs> Esau was. He wanted everything just right. And Jacob wanted one thing and that was a birthright and that's all he cared about. And Esau, you see what happened to both boys. And even out of Jacob come the twelve patriarchs which brought forth, well, the twelve tribes of Israel. Out of Jacob and he called, and God called Jacob his own son. Amen. Amen. Do you see what I mean? Amen. That Holy Ghost ought to be more important to you than everything else there is in the world. Amen. Your prestige, your life, your job, your anything that there is. Amen. You should not say. Cease until you have it. You must receive it. It must be the most... In, you say, well, I'm afraid that, that, at my work. I'm afraid at my husband. My Don't be afraid. Let that be first place. Let everything else go. Let that be first. Well, I expect to get it one of these days, Brother Brown. Not one of these days now. This is the time. Let it be first before I... Before I do anything else, uh, let me have it now. Amen. Desperate. That would help answer a question. You're just, when you get desperate for it, really got to have it or die. Amen. See, that's when you're going to get it. A little Jew used to be here in town. I don't know whether you knew him or not. He'd been healed of cancer. They give him, turned him out. And when he was... Baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, then they really turned him out. Put him out in the yard, and then he went and joined the Methodist church, and they found out that he is baptized in the name of Jesus, and they set him out in zero weather, about 10 below in Ohio. Put him a bed out there. Brother Fleeman, you ought to remember uh, Brother Vance, aren't you? Put him out out there, and the pump of water out there, and said, There's enough water for you to be rebaptized in Jesus' name, I guess. However, he was telling me a little story once. He said that when this m certain peoples, his wife, they were staying with, and he gathered all of his old stuff up in an old broke-up truck and started out of town. And his wife said, you know what? I ought to got a drink of water before I left that place. said, I'm thirsty. Well, he said, honey, there's a hydrant. said, well, go on to hit a better place, says he. And he went a little farther and he said, there's another hydrant. He said, well, uh, just uh, go ahead, see. But said then when she got out into the country, there was no pump. said, she was just fighting for, for a drink of water. And said, after a while, way over in the field was an old country pump. Way out in the field. Plumb across through a bunch of cattle and she was afraid of the cattle. But he said, she said, I, uh, Levy, I just got to have a drink. So the, he stopped the car and said before he could even get the car hardly stopped, she was out and had that cutting across the fence. She had to have water. And when God becomes that real to you, when you thirst like that, that it's either God or you'll die, you can't stand it any longer. Then something's going to happen. It's got, you get to business then with God. That's when you take, it takes place. Now, these evil spirits deceive people. And them spirits many times are very religious. Now, you say you mean religious? Yes, sir. Even teach the scriptures, Amen. the Bibles. Yes, you sure do. Now, notice. Jesus came to a bunch of men that was holy priests. And they kept the laws to the letter. And they were very, very religious. And Jesus, John called them, said, You generation of vipers, that's snakes. Who's warned you to flee from the wrath to come? 
When Jesus saw him, he said, you are of your father, the devil. That was God saying that. Just as religious as they could be. Remember, when the devil takes his man, but never his spirit. God takes his man, but never his spirit. See, the Holy Spirit comes into your life and sanctifies your spirit, lives through you and gives you power to live. But when, when your spirit goes on, your spirit is kept with God, but the Holy Spirit was on you, comes on somebody else and somebody else and somebody else. The spirit was up on Elijah, come up on Elisha, a double portion of it, 700 years later or 800 years later, come up on John the Baptist, made him act. Look how Elijah, look how Elijah was. Big old hairy man, whiskers all over him, sheepskin, looked like a fuzzy worm, his face out like that, stomping down through there with a big piece of leather around his girdles like, uh, uh, girdles around his loins like this. If you would have, if he'd walked up to your house, you'd said, who am I? Call the police right quick. Such a fellow standing in front of my door. But that was the prophet of the law. Sure was. And then, when he died, a double portion of his spirit come up on Elijah. And then 800 years later, come up on John the Baptist and made John act just exactly like they did. Because it was the spirit of Elijah. Amen. Now, if the spirit of Elijah up on John will make John act like Elijah, the spirit of God up on you will make you act like Jesus. Amen. Now, there's where you find the Holy Spirit. Okay? That's what the Holy Spirit does. It makes you meek, makes you humble, makes you forgiving. Could they pull whiskers from your face if you had them there? Jerk them out and spit in your face when you had the power to call a legions of angels. Could you do that for the love of the people that was spitting in your face? Could you do it? If somebody just walked up to you and said, Hey, you hypocrite, and smacks you on one side of the face, could you pray for their forgiveness? Now, that's where trust is. That's where you got the Holy Spirit. Now. When somebody says something evil against someone, sometimes it claims to have the Holy Spirit. I'll get even with her if it takes me my last day. Okay? Now, there's where you check about your Holy Spirit. Blessed are you when man shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. But you go get even with them. Oh, rejoice and be exceedingly glad. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. See? When someone says evil about you, say something good. If you can't say something good about them, then don't say nothing. Just let it go. See? Yeah. Then when you get to yourself, pray for them. If there's one thing in my life that's helped me to understand if the Holy Spirit came into me down there that day has been that. I was hot-headed, fiery, Irish on both sides and I always could never eat hard at all. My mouth was always mashed where somebody mashed it. Jumping up where I shouldn't jump up. I've got front of my teeth broke out now and Phil where I, I spoke when I oughtn't to speak, you see, and said they always in trouble. And I said... Somebody said to me, my teacher at school, she said, I said, lady, I, I, I can't help it. See, I'd get in trouble all the time. And I said, I can't help it. Poor old Mother Temple. She just went to glory the other day. And she said, um, well, look, honey, she got me up on her lap. And she pulled me up in her arms and started crying. First time I'd ever had love like that from somebody, an old woman. She just cried over top of me. She said, Billy, I'm going to do something for you, honey. I'm going to give you a little piece of string. And said, if any of the boys jumps on you, call me Corncracker, because I was from Kentucky, you know. And, and uh, I was, I really was terribly dressed. And they'd make fun of my hair hanging pretty near as long as it is now. And uh, all down over my face. And I was just having an awful time, you know. And, and they would beat me around and slap. Anytime anybody gets their temper up, they'd walk around and just get a hold of me and slap me down. And here I'd come, see. And um, so then, in a fight. And we got, we got, I even had knife fights and everything else. And. It took a Winchester rifle and tried to shoot it, pumped it right into four or five boys and beat me that I couldn't hardly stand up. Would have killed every one of them had it been for God. 
picked up the shells off the ground, put them back in the gun, and just shoot as good as they ever did. See? That would have been a murder of five men, probably or five boys, who was only about 12 years old, high-tempered. And the teacher said, you take this little string, Billy, and whenever you get mad, you just stop and tie nine knots in that string. Say, when you do that, then you bring the string to me, I bet your temper will be over. I said, Miss Whalen, I sure think you're so nice. I said, I'm going to try it. Or Miss Temple, I said, Miss Whalen. I said, Miss Temple, Mr. Whalen was a teacher up here. One of the so I, I put the string in my pocket and I hadn't been out in the yard five minutes and somebody popped me on. I started on him, you know. I reached down and grabbed my string and I started tying one knot. I threw the string down and away I went, see. I just couldn't do it, see. And I said, I could never be a Christian. But let me tell you, that night down yonder on Ohio Avenue, when the Holy Spirit came into me, that settled the temper. That was over. I said, I could never do it. I could never be a Christian because I'd never get over that. I said, something's born in me. I said, boy, my daddy was hot-headed. And my mother, half Indian, enough temper to find a buzz saw. I said, me? Oh, I, uh, boy, anybody that jumps on me is going to get it. That's all. I said, if I've climb up on a step ladder to hit him, I said, I'll sure do it, see. But now you could drag me out there and wallow me in. <laughs> see? Why? Not me. What am I trying to make a point here? Something happened. Amen. That old power, that old William Branham died. And someone else come in. And it makes me feel sorry for my enemy. When anyone does anything wrong to me, I never pray against them. I pray for them. And that's where the Holy Spirit gave that test the other night in New England before this happened down here. When, that, when He gave power, He said, Just speak what you will to them people the way they had done. And I looked down there and I said, I forgive you. That's exactly what He wanted, see? Forgive your enemies. See, these are the spirits that make you evil. Watch them spirits. Here comes somebody by. He's up there in a tomb. Somebody come by. He'd run out and overcome them, the Bible said. No one is so dangerous to nobody could pass that way. But one day, there was a stronger power passed. He was possessed with hatred, malice, death, legion of them walking around, big fellow. They'd go out there and take an army and put him in chains. And he'd break the chains loose. And the devil was in him. There he was. He was a so he, had been a, he had been a real idol for the Jeffersonville High School. <laughs> sure hey, was. Man, there he was. All this big, there's some of these teenagers, you know. Oh, he's real man. I've seen men that weigh 200 pounds and have an ounce of man in them. That's not man. Oh, that's that's right. brute. See? But there was a little bitty stoop-shouldered fella come down the road one day. Kind of bent down. The Bible said there's no beauty we should desire him. 30 years old and passed for 50. Walking down the road one day and he run out to meet him. He said, I'll just take that little fella and wind him around. But oh my. When he met that one, he fell at his feet. And then they were so possessing. Now look, that day he was so possessed with the devil now this, I want to put this into you, for you. He was, that man was so completely yielded to the devil till the devil used his tongue to talk. Now you can be so completely yielded to God that God can use your tongue Amen. to talk. Amen. Amen. That's right. That's what I claim any sermon that I ever preached that had any meaning to it is when I got yielded, got William Branham out of the way. And Christ could take in and start talking, see. And he can speak in the language. Now notice, he was so possessed of that evil spirit. And that spirit had him so close to them, demons know their time had come because they had met love. See? And they said, we'll try him. And all, now I notice what's taking place. He said, why, we know who you are. Why are you in that little bitty body like this? Little frail looking fellow. Said, why are you coming like that? Said, we know who you are. You're the Holy One of Israel. And why do you... Now watch, if you don't believe that there's a future torment for devils, listen to these confess it. Why comest thou to torment us before the time comes? Amen. 
They know there's a future torment. Why comest thou to torment us before the time comes? See? And Jesus said, what's your name? He knew he wanted them to confess it. He said, we are a legion, for there's many of us. He said, if you're going to cast us out of this man, look, a little frail fellow like Jesus standing there. And a man who could whip almost an army. Chains couldn't even hold him. See, it isn't physical strength. That isn't what counts. It's the power of the Holy Spirit that's in your life that counts. See? He said, don't torment us before the time comes, but if you'll cast us out, look at the meanness of them, the wickedness. If you're going to cast us out, don't let us just go free uh, out into the world because it's hard to tell where we get into somebody else. If you will cast us out, we want to be in somebody. We want to do something. We want to do some more meanness. That's the devil. I'll get back with him. Mm. See, that's the devil. I'll get even with him. See? Just remember, it's your brother standing there, but the devil got on him. Let us do something mean. We can make these Gadareans over here suffer for this. Might have said the head of one of them. Said, let us go over here on that herd of swine. Jesus said, take your leave. But come out of him. <laughs> oh my. Little bitty guy like that speaking to that big legion of devils. Come out of him. You had your leave. And they... Got into those hogs and they had fits. Run them hogs into fits. And down the way they went to the river and drowned it in the river. Choked themselves in the river. Isn't that right? Now, when they did, of course the devils went out of them because it killed the hogs. They just run them into a fit. They had a fit just like uh, anyone. Did you ever see a person have a temper fit? Well, that's just that's what it is. That's the same devils. That's what happened to them. You ever see anyone having a temper fit? You say, oh, uh-huh. I know what happened in Gadarean. <laughs> see? That's just exactly. Just a few more come in there running completely insane. Because a medical doctor will tell you that temper is the first stage of insanity. That's what Mayo said. First stage of insanity. Brother Pat, that might have been rude. <laughs> That's the best I know. Just unexpected. <laughs> All right, Romans, the seventh chapter, the 25th verse. I've got to, I forgot, I looked that up the other day when I got it, but I forget just what it is. Let's answer this dear person's question, if we can. Romans 7, 22. All right, or 25, I beg your pardon. Romans 7, I turned two pages at once then. That's the reason. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So that, so then with the mind, with the, the mind, I myself serve the law of God. But with the flesh, the law of sin. Now, wait a minute. I didn't get that read just right. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind. Yeah, that's right. I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. All right? That's exactly what Paul said many times over. When I would do good, evil is present. See? That's exactly what you do too. With your mind. at your heart. See? Now remember, you do not think with your mind. Neither do you see with your eyes. Neither do you, you, you see with your heart. Did you know that? Amen. Amen. Did you know your heart has another person in it besides yourself? Amen. Science just found that out about four years ago. You know, a little compartment in the heart that say the soul lives. Did you ever hear of subconscious? You start to do anything and you think, oh, I'm just wide over top of it. But your subconscious tells you different. They can take a lie detector, 
I see my good friend, Attorney Robinson, sitting in the back. I don't know where he ever seen it done or not, but I happened to have it tried it put on me one time about this angel of the Lord here. And they put a lie detector on you, and you try in to confess to the best of your knowledge, the best that you can make it, just so nice and smooth over that you didn't do such and such a thing, a criminal. That lie detector will turn right back and say you're lying. See? Why? It's the vibration of your nerves that they pick up on that lie detector. See? It, uh, it'll tell you because why? Man was not made to lie in his original beginning. It's sin and the devil that's on you that makes you lie. See? You wasn't, your makeup is not to lie. That's the reason you have to live again because you was made, created to live forever. Live always. But see, sin came in and brought death to the body. And then when sin comes in and brings death to the body, then of course the body has to die. But it in there can dwell eternal life. When this spirit is changed in you and you got eternal life, God will raise that body up again at the last day. He said he would do it. So with my mind, the mind... The, he said in another place, I think I have the mind of Christ. Now, in that mind, you serve with the mind of Christ, you serve God. See, the inward part. See, the inward part, you serve God, that subconscious. That's where faith lies. I want to ask you, was there many times that you people here, many of you have seen times where you would... Um, you just know something was going to happen. It looked like it's impossible for it, but you just know it was going to happen. Did you ever have that? Amen. That's that faith, that subconscious of working. Now, if it's getting a little warm in here, you turn that gadget down down there if it's getting a little bit too warm for you. Now, in there, that subconscious, see, that's where your mind. Now, Jesus said, except the man be born again. Now, that's not what I want. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except the man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, you couldn't see the kingdom of God because the kingdom of God is the Holy Spirit. Amen. Some stand here around to his death till they see the kingdom coming in power, he said. Then, the kingdom of God, the Bible said, is within you. It's within you, the Holy Spirit. And you can't see that with your eyes. So see means to understand. Have you ever looked at anything looking right at it and say, well, I just don't see it. See? I just don't see it. You mean you don't understand it. See? Yeah. See, you don't understand it. To see is to understand. But with your eyes, you look at anything. But with what's inside of you, you understand what you see with that. See? With the eyes of God, you look. And now... Hold your point now. Here's a good one. If you're ready for it. The Christian looks at things that he doesn't see with his eyes. Amen. Amen. See? For we look at the unseen. Amen. See? How do you look at it? With your inside eyes. Amen. You see it by faith. Amen. And uh, to prove that, the whole Christian armor... Is made up of unseen qualities. What is a Christian armor? Somebody says seeing is believing. That person would never be a Christian. Because the armor of the Christian is made up of this. Love. Did you ever see it? You see it in action, but you never seen love. If you can, pull your part of love out. Let me see what it looks like. <laughs> love. Love. Joy. Peace, long-suffering, goodness, meekness, faith, faith, gentleness. See? The whole Christian armor is unseen with the natural eye. Amen. But it is understood by the heart. Amen. There you are. There you are. Paul said then, with my mind, and I have the mind of Christ, you see, he said. I serve God with my mind, but my flesh... How did he word that there at the last? Um, but with the flesh, the law of sin. What is it? My flesh says tonight, you are too tired. 
Your throat is too sore. You are, you've been out in the wind today. You shall not go to church tonight. That's the law of the flesh. You just might as well call them up and tell Brother Neville to send the questions down and tell him to answer them. But you see, I promise to do it. See? Now, my mind, on the inside the Holy Spirit, said, you keep your promise. But the flesh said, you're too tired. <laughs> See? Now the flesh said, now there's no need, you pretty little thing. You're the prettiest little thing in school. Now don't you pay attention to that holy roaring mother of yours, or that fanatic father. See? You're the best looking girl in school. You're the prettiest boy, the best looking boy, the best built. You're the most popular there is in the city. You see? That, that. And you yield your members to that. And where do you come out at? The little end of the horn every time. See? Yeah, Paul said, my flesh wants, to, wants always to yield to that. Your flesh does too. Amen. See? But the law of the Spirit of God in the heart overcomes Amen. the flesh Lord, Hallelujah. and Hallelujah. makes the body obey what the heart Amen. says do. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Look. Then, if it will do that for a sinner, then won't that work for sickness too? Amen. The law of the Spirit of God in the heart that knows that by His stripes we were healed... They stand with their power and make that sickness in that body obey them because it's the devil. There you are. Hallelujah. Praise our God. That's got cream on it that deep. I tell you. That's it. See? Now, the law of sin and death works in your flesh. But the law of the spirit of life works in your heart. Amen. So your heart, your spirit in your heart will make your body obey what it says do. That's exactly right. Now that's why Paul said, always the flesh. I'm too tired. I'm unable. I'm not sufficient. I cannot do it. I said to, to Lois or, or Dolores or somebody who's been talking to me about the Holy Ghost, about something or like that. I said... I said, what, Lord, I said what, what made me feel that way just at the time that I should have felt good? I said, the devil, he seen you just ready to receive it. Amen. He said, I'll put a little damper on her, <sighs> fan her, <laughs> a little bit, you know, kind of cool down a little. See? But oh my, that's when you rise. Amen. Amen. Claim your God-given rights. Yes. Amen. That's what Paul was meaning. See? The, always when he said when I would do good. Yes. Evil is present. Tell you what you do. I've noticed this, my wife and I, and I'll just hurry back because I've just got a few minutes longer and I've got some big questions here. I don't want to keep you too late, but I want to get your questions the best I can. Notice, I can start in the morning and say I'm going, uh, the Lord lead me to go to a certain place for a meeting. Well, brother, you just watch everything take place. Or you let me get at my home and some long distant call comes in. I, I got to pray for the sick. Little Joseph will climb right up on top of my neck. Sarah want to ask me a question. Becky will start on the piano. I'll say, hey, hey, shh, shh. Put my hand over. Hey, shh, shh, shh. I'm going to, Daddy's going to pray for the sick. Well, Daddy, look, Joe done this, uh, see... It just let it start. Yeah. And as soon as the prayer is over, they got their toys and it's sweet and clean. It's the devil. Amen. Yeah. Certainly it is. And then I'll come around and say, Joseph, you shouldn't do a certain thing. And you know, the first thing you know, he's got in the habit. And you find it in your children, they'll lie to you. Yeah. Well, that's a lying spirit on that baby. Yeah. There's only one remedy for it. The gun stick ain't my idea. You know, the ramrod, we used to get to beat with Brother Jess when we got a, got a, got in trouble. We used to say the, the ramrod out of the old guns, the hickory stick, you know, the old muzzle loaders. That isn't the idea. But prayer. Cast that evil devil away from that child. 
That's Amen. right. Help us, Lord. Prayer does it. If little Martha starts stomping her little foot and running out and turning up her little nose, you could beat her if she didn't have any clothes on her. She'd do it anyhow. But you just lay before God and claim that child's soul for God. You stay right there with it. Amen. I believe it's the best thing that I know of. Amen. That's, Amen. that's the best remedy I know of is prayer. Amen. Now, let's see now. The next one here says, What is meant by predestination before the world began? Where is it in the Bible? Predestination before the world began. All right, my precious friend, let us turn to Ephesians, the first chapter, just for one place. We won't take too long on this one, I don't think, unless it doesn't answer right. And let's just start reading here at Ephesians, the first chapter. Now, the first thing I want to say this, that predestination is a bad word for a minister to, to use before an untrained congregation. See, it is. I don't use it sometimes here at the church. But out in the audiences, out in the big world, uh, everything's piled in from uh, everything. I watch that word. I always use the word foreknowledge. Because predestination is only the foreknowledge of God. God being infinite, by foreknowledge, He knew everything or He isn't infinite. See, he knew what would happen. So by foreknowledge, he could predestinate. That's the reason I believe that God, that God just doesn't just like the air you're breathing. I disagree with the Jehovah Witness on that idea that your breath is your spirit. It can't be. See, your spirit's in your heart. See? And you got your spirit before you ever come to the world. God told Jeremiah that he knew him and sanctified him. And made him a prophet over the nation, over the nations, before he was ever conceived in his mother's womb. See, at Jeremiah one four. Now, <clears throat> notice. So we see that all these things are foreknowledge. Seven hundred and twelve years before Jesus was born, before John was born, Isaiah saw him in a vision. Said he was the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Seven hundred and twelve years. From the Garden of Eden, Jesus Christ, before the foundation of the world. Hallelujah. Let's read this. Ephesians 1. Let's just start the first chapter. So, uh, the first verse. Paul, an apostle. Now, watch how he addresses this. I like this way of Paul. I like Paul, don't you? Oh, he was a wonderful servant of Christ. Now, watch this. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and the faithful in Christ Jesus. Notice, this is not addressed to the world. This is not addressed to the outsider. This is to the church that's in Jesus Christ. Oh, isn't that lovely? The church in Jesus Christ. That's How do you get in Jesus Christ now? By one spirit, we're all baptized into one body. Now, I, I, he, and he's directing this to Holy Ghost filled people. See? Not to the outside world. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God our Father, the, the God and our Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in all heavenly places, uh, and spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Oh, my. Wouldn't you like to set it on some of that? Amen. Well, we are. Amen. Amen. Sure. Same Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. He said, now, as you're setting together in heavenly places in Christ Amen. Jesus, Amen. Amen. God has blessed us with all spiritual blessings, Sister Rose. I believe that. that uh, I couldn't think of your name the other day. I believe you were in a prayer line or something. I, I remember trying to think of it later. And I, uh, but your name is Rose Austin, isn't that right? I re- used to come here to Tabernacle all the time. That's it. All right. Now, blessed be the, the God of our Father, Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings, all spir- in heavenly places. Let's see if I'm reading that, uh, quoting that right. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Assemble together now 
in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. According as he... Now listen. Are you all ready? <laughs> According as he has chosen us in him before... I preached to you. Before the foundation of the world. Now see, he can talk to the church. He wouldn't say that to babies. But he's talking to a church. That's already in Christ. Now he couldn't go out here to just some church and say, Well now, um, uh, uh, that. It's those elected ones. That's in Christ. Now you say, Well, I believe that I'm in Christ. If you are, you've received the Holy Ghost. Because that's the only way that you can get into Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Amen. See, 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter. All right. For by one Spirit, we are all baptized into one body, which is Amen. the body of Christ. Amen. Now, then we set together in heavenly places in one accord. Mm. Amen. Yeah. Holy Spirit moving among us, teaching us, showing us great things, bringing things to pass. Oh, what a place. He said, now you that's been called like that, I want to speak to you. You, the chosen ones that God chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. Think of that. Amen. God chose us in Him. Him before the foundation of the world. Amen. God knew before the foundation of the world that I'd speak this same subject tonight. Amen. He's infinite. Yeah. And before there was a world. Oh. Whew. Here, get the Holy Ghost now. Amen. The Word will bring. Amen. Yes, amen. That's how I come while Peter spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on. Amen. Before there was a world, you were in God's thoughts to give you the Holy Ghost because He knew that you'd be wanting it and He chose you Himself because you desired. He chose you in Christ before you are Jesus, any of you was on the earth. And He sent Jesus to die to prepare the way to send the Holy Ghost to bring you to Himself. Amen. Hmm. Oh, that just, I know, I mean, this is a church, so I'm at home now, I see. Oh, that is so rich to me. Amen. To think it's not what I wanted. It wasn't my desires. It wasn't my will. It wasn't my choosing. I had not one thing to do with it. Amen. But before the world ever started, God saw us and put our name on the Lamb's book of life before there even was a word. Amen. Talk Amen. about God. Amen. I stood out under that big glass. You can see 120 million years of light space. When I looked and seen that, I didn't get to see through the glass. I seen the picture where they took it. And I just had to raise up my hands there in that place. And I said, how great thou art. How great thou art. And before one of those planets ever turned, Hallelujah! Amen. God chose us in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Now how great thou art! Hallelujah! Praise our God! Yes, sir. Before there was a world, before there was a planet, Amen. before there was a sun, before there was a moon, before there was light, before there was anything, when it was still God. God and His thoughts, the eternal thoughts of God, chose you by predestination, by foreknowledge, to know that you would be on the earth, to know that there would be sin. Someone said, then why, did, why was there sin? If there had never been sin, His attributes would have never been a Savior. Amen. There had to be a sinner so He could be a Savior. There had to be a sick man so He could be a healer. Amen. Amen. There you are. It had to be that way. It was God who, who saw it and foreordained it that the devil ain't even in the race. Amen. <laughs> oh, he's just a stump on the side of the road. 
that God used Hallelujah. to bring children to Him crying, Abba, Father. Yes, no amen. wonder on that day how the angels will sing when we're singing the redemption amen. stories the angels will bow their head don't know what we're talking about. Amen. Sure. They never was lost. They don't know what it is. They don't know how good we feel to know that we which were once sinners and alienated from God without hope, without mercy, without God in a world of corruption, dying, going to a devil's hell and God stooped down and picked us up and redeemed us and now we're above the angels. Amen. Right now. Which is an angel's a servant. We're sons and daughters. Amen. Which is the most thought of your servant or your son or daughter? Oh my prayer from a saint will go a million times higher than an angel. Amen. Yes, sir, because he's a son. Hallelujah. Oh. Praise our God. That's right, my brother, sister. Amen. You don't the church. I don't believe this side of, of eternity how we'll ever realize that what you are, the position that you are, that God has placed you, you spirit-filled people. Uh, you're uh, sons of God. Help us, Lord. Exactly. One angel's a servant. You're a son. An angel can only bring you a message. Amen. But you have to act. Amen. Oh, amen. You're the actor on the scene. You're the son. The angels are servant to bring you the message. They hear, I brought you this message for you to do so and so. This is from Father. I bring it to you. Yes. That's all he is. Amen. Help us, Lord. You're sons and daughters of God. Help us to see. Predestinated us. Now watch just a minute. Hallelujah. According as he, he has chosen us. Not we didn't choose it. How could I choose him? 400 billion, million, billion, trillion years ago, how could I chose him? But he chose me. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Oh, Brother Woods, that's it. Amen. Chosen us and him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy. Now, don't try to make it yourself because you can't. And without blame before Him in love. Oh, brother, that will answer a question I seen in here just a few minutes ago. Somewhere, I, I seen this. Oh, yes. You said, how could a man live above, live so close to God he would be without sin? Listen to this. Holy. For foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. His love did it. His love paid for my sins. His love taken it away. Love is the most powerful force there is. You take a husband that really loves his wife, he'd die for her freely. And brotherly love, there was a man, a certain man, comes to this church once in a while, I'm up in the country, was sitting at his brother's house the other day. He said, what if something happened, Brother Bill? He said, gladly would I stick out my chest to catch a bullet for him. <laughs> See? Die for you. That's love. Greater love is no man in them that will lay down his life for him. His brother. See? Love. Chosen us in love. Before the foundation of the world. Now watch. Having predestinated us. Now there's the word predestinated. Having predestinated us. Unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to Himself according to according to the good pleasure of His will. <laughs> what about that, Brother Mike? Isn't that wonderful? He loved you. He loved you before there's a world. He knows your nature. He knows your weaknesses. He knows your habits. He knows all about you. What you going to be. And then when he looked all over the great uh, universe as it was, he said, I choose you. And when he did that, before there ever was a speck of, of light, then you're eternal with God. Amen. When you receive the Holy Ghost, then you become eternal because you have, you're with God. You're a part of God. Amen. Can you see what I mean? Amen. You're as eternal as God is because you're, I'm as much brand as my father was a brand. 
because I'm a blood of a brand. I'm a Brandon with my father because I was born of my father. I'm a Brandon with him. You're a wood because of your father being wood. You're as much wood as Jim wood as you're just bank wood. Amen. Oh my. You're neville because it's your father was a neville. Amen. You're just as much neville as he was neville. Yeah. Glory! Amen. Well, just as eternal as God is. Amen. Because you are born of God. Sons and daughters of God, God eternal life that can never perish. Hallelujah. I'll raise it up in the last day. Amen. No wonder when he's fixing to cut Paul's head off out there. He had to walk that death route. He wrote that last letter to Timothy. He said, I fought a good fight. I finished my course. <laughs> I've kept the faith. Hallelujah. <laughs> Henceforth there's laid up for me the crown the righteous judge will give me at that day. Not only me, but all that love is appearing. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Then death said, I'm coming at you. He said, where is your sting? The grace that I'll get you said, where is your victory? Amen. But he had an example. Look back to Calvary. said, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory Amen. through our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. There you are. Mm. Praise God. It has to stir emotions. It's Amen. just got to. Yes. Life is, the word is going out. Life, the word life catches life in within a human being. It's something has to scream out. You know, someone said, Billy, what makes the people raise up and throw up their hands or say, praise the Lord. Amen. Watch what the Bible said. Paul said, if we spoke in unknown tongues, how would the unlearned, when he's blessed, if he'd be blessed, how could he say amen? See? You've got to know what you're talking about. Unknown tongues, unless it's by interpretation or revelation. Then he can say amen if he can understand it. He knows what he's saying. See? Now, oh my, look over there that day when the enemy was coming in on David and he'd give him all the flagon of wine and, and um, a good piece of meat and bread and and when the enemy was coming, they didn't know what to do, and they gathered out there, and all Israel gathered together under the circumcision. Now, this is under the old Jewish circumcision. And they lifted up their hands and said, God, you are our God. You have protected us. You brought Moses, the prophet, and you brought the children of Israel out of Egypt. You brought them up through the desert. When they were in there, no one feared to touch them. Everyone feared to touch them. No one come near your heritage. There was a scared to, yet they were in the minority, but everybody left hands off of them. For everything that got on to them, they got stung back. He said, oh, what a great God you are. Now, Lord, if we sin, here's our wives, here's our little children, and we're in distress at this hour. He said, oh, what can we do? The enemies are coming. He said, what can we do? And while they were praying, the Spirit fell upon one out there in the audience. And he prophesied, Thus saith the Lord. Amen. You not fight, stand still. <laughs> Amen. Go down by a certain way and meet him there. And he caused confusion among them and they killed one another. Amen. Mm. Amen. God. There you are. Predestinated to be chosen in Christ Jesus before the foundation of the world. Now, you said. That a person could live so close to God that he could not sin while you're on this earth. Then explain 1 John 1, 8 to 10. Let's see 1 John 1, 8 to 10. If I had a little more time to look these. I had it, but I just didn't take it, friends. I, I was trying to... To get out, uh, well, I'll find John after a while. It'll be on the other side of Hebrews, of course. <laughs> All right. First John 1, 8 to 10. First John 1, 8 to 10. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, 
We make him a liar, and the word is not in us. Well, now, wait, my dear brother. Just turn right over to the third chapter here in the ninth verse. You're right on the same page in my Bible. Eighth verse to begin with. He that committed sin is of the devil. For the devil sinned from the beginning. For the purpose, the Son of God was made manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil. Just what I've been talking about. See, God predestinated knowing you. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he's He's because he is born of God. That's just what the word says. Now, if you watch her, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and the word is not in us. Now, some people say, when I hear it's just a good little girl or a good little boy, they never sinned to begin with. You're born in sin. You're shaped in iniquity. Come to the world speaking lies. <coughs> When you're born in this world, you are a liar, you're a thief, you're everything there is. Just, uh, all the sin, not a thief because you haven't stole. But you're, but you're, having, you're not a liar because you've not lied. But that spirit is in you when you're born because you're of the world. Amen. That's the reason that you can't have reformation to reform. You've got to die and be born. Amen. And you cannot have birth without crucifixion. You can't have resurrection. You must be crucified to the things of the world or to be resurrected in Christ. If you're going to depend upon your, your intellectual conceptions and so forth, you'll never be born of the Spirit of God. You've got to forget, like Paul did, all that he ever knowed and know nothing among you except Christ Jesus, Amen. born anew, afresh. Oh, if... Here. If I could get it to you. See, it's a birth that makes a new generation, a new creation. Amen. The very Greek word here, as I was looking it up in the Greek election the other day, the word birth means creation. When it says you are a new creature in Christ Jesus, the word there, creature, is the word creation. You are a new creation, not in the world, but in Christ Jesus. Amen. You've been anew. Now you was in the world, you said, Oh, uh, you know, the fancy things is fine clothes or some pretty something. Oh, religion's on the side. See, oh, I go to church here. I don't want to go to hell. But, uh, you know, and uh, 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 pretty brown eyes to the girl or uh, the little wavy hair for the boy or he's a very, you know, or something other. Just something to attract attention or lustful or a drinking or something other there. That's the world. That, you're, you're in the world. And the Bible said, if you love the world and the things of the world, the love of God's not even in you. Amen. Amen. So in order to get that out of you, you have to die. Amen. Amen. Have to die, be crucified and buried and resurrected a new creation in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, before you receive the Holy Ghost, you are believing unto eternal life. But you do not have eternal life until you re receive the Holy Ghost. Because it is eternal life. The Holy Ghost is God. It's God's life in you. Then you got eternal life. Do you understand that now? Amen. See, look. See, you're believing on two. Wait, here's a good thing. You, you women, excuse me for this. If it sounds too flat. See, make a point. A mother. There's life. But still, that baby isn't born. But if you treat that baby right and follow the rules of nature, that baby will be born normally. But if you don't apply everything to the rules of nature, you let a hard bruise or a hit or, or something take place, it, it's going to ruin it. See? They kill the baby before it's born. Well, that's what's the matter. The bruises come from Satan. Satan takes the poison darts of hell and try to bruise the church that's in travail with a baby, and before it's ever born, they kill it. Amen. Uh, but if you just take the Bible and nurture it in the, give it baby food, 
The mother taking vitamins. Well, this is the best vitamin I know of. Spiritual vitamin, you see. It, it builds you up. Now, the church ought to be taking spiritual vitamins. And the vitamins is right here, whole book full of them. And you must be taking spiritual vitamins, learning. And that brings forth the baby to a birth. See what I mean? Now the little fella, when he, he, he's got life, he's, he's got life because the little cells are moving and kicking and after about three months and, uh, or four, and then he's kicking and moving, but he isn't born yet. But as soon as he is brought into the world, the doctor, mother, or someone holds him up and <laughs> gives him a little spank and Wah! there he goes, see? And then he starts breathing. And just as soon as he breathes, the breath of life, then he becomes a living soul. And that's what sometimes... You ready to receive the Holy Ghost? You're in travail. You're wanting to be delivered. How many in here is in that shape right now? Wanting the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Really want to know what it is. Want to get, get into it. Wants the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Raise up your hands. See? You're in travail. You're wanting. You're wanting to be delivered. What you need is a little gospel spank. A little something and, and you scream out, glory! And when it happens, I know you think I'm crazy, but we, we have the mind of Christ, which is craziness to the world anyhow. Something screams in, and then that spirit surges you. Then it just keeps coming. Like I said to a person, it's like an old stopped up pipe. And you run a little wire through it. And you got to hold this wire zig, zig, zig. Zig, and there's a great flow of water trying to get through it. Zig, zig. You can't get it, but you know there's something up there. You can feel it. It's up on that end. Then after a while, give her a great big pull and goes the water through the pipe. That's the way it is. Then the water just keeps on coming. That's the way the Holy Spirit is. The sin stopped up the pipes. You, you, you sit back and say, I'm timid. <laughs> you know, I just couldn't say that. I'm afraid that people think I'm as a holy roller, see? That's now, when you feel that little tugging of the Spirit, you want it more than life. It's, you want more than your own life. It means more to you. You've got to have it or die. The first thing you know, you get a hold of something. You say, that's it, Lord. You pull the cork out. Here she comes. Gone. Amen. Oh, my. Free. Woo. My own trip to present eyes and how to set me to the glory of God. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Peter and them was back in behind there at Pentecost, high and said, Look out the door real easy. See if any of them Jews out there coming. No, don't see one of them. All right, be real still, fellas. I tell you, if they ever come up here, they'll pull us out. That's just all there is to it. Stay close. It's all sitting there. All of a sudden, there come a sound. Amen. Like a rushing mighty wind. They begin to fill all the house where they were sitting. Uh, Something began to take place. Out of that building, they went. Throwed open the doors, down the steps, it went into there, staggered like a bunch of drunk men. Just a screaming and a carrying on. They said, These men are drunk, listen at them. Look at that coward looking out the door. The one that denied Jesus down there at the crucifixion said, I didn't even know him. A little woman said, Well, your speech betrays you. You're one of them. Said, he cursed and I don't know him. But when that cork was pulled out, Amen. The Spirit began to flow through. Amen. He said, You men of Judea and you that dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and hearken to me. Amen. Hey, man, I'm boss. Let this be known to you. These are not drunk. Take it up for his church. These are not drunk as you suppose. This is the third hour of the day, but this is that which is spoken of by the prophet Joel. It will come to pass in the last day, saith God, I'll pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. Mm, what a difference. Ah, I know you might think this is a terrible thing, but I, I, I must let you see what's true. Stay with it. Now, certainly you have eternal life now to explain this. This says, uh, if we say we have sinned not, all has sinned and come short of the glory of God. We make God a liar. He said you had sinned. If you say you haven't sinned, I'm, I was born in the Baptist church, Methodist church, Pentecostal church, Presbyterian church. I was born. I don't make a bit of difference. You got to be born out of it again. That's right. <laughs> if we say we sin not, you make him a liar. And the word, which is the truth. How many knows the word's the truth? 
In the beginning was the Word, the Word's made flesh and Word. Sanctify them, Father, through the truth. Thy Word is the truth, and He was the Word, see. And the Word of Christ is not in you. He was the Word. How many of you know that, see? Amen. All right. That, we read it like this then. If you say you have sinned not, you make him a liar, and Christ is not in us. See? See? Now, that, see, when you say that you sin, that you haven't sinned, you're wrong. You've got to be born again. Now, I'll turn over here to this other verse. He, whosoever is born of God, does not commit sin. Does not commit sin. For, now, what is sin? Who said that? Somebody. Unbelief. That's what the Bible said. There's only one sin, and that's unbelief. That's right. He that believeth not is condemned already. See? So, one of them sin. Now, if you say, well, now, wait a minute. I believe that they might have got the Holy Ghost like that in them days, but I don't believe it so. But, brother, the Bible said, the promises to you and your children, I know, but you're sinning. You're sinning right there. You're disbelieving what God said. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and forever. Well, we're taught that, I don't care what you're taught, the Bible said. He said, let every man's word be a lie and mine true. Amen. All right. You say, well, he, principally he's the same, but I don't, uh, you mean he's the same? Yeah, in the church, doing the same things he did when he's here. Oh, I can't believe that. You're sinning. Amen. You're sinning. And he that's born of God, of the Holy Ghost, don't say those things. And if he Amen. says he's got the Holy Ghost and says those things, that's the evidence he hasn't got it. Amen. Care what he done. If you don't believe in divine healing, don't believe in the power of the resurrection, don't believe in the Holy Ghost being poured out upon us, just exactly like it is to, in the first day, just the same God yesterday, today, and forever, the same things the apostles done happening right now, speaking in tongues, rejoicing, and all these other things. If they don't believe that, he's not born of God for whosoever is born of God does not commit those kind of things. Amen. That's how to tell whether you're born of God. If you walk up to a fellow and say, Dr. P.H. so-and-so-and-so, Reverend Doctor so-and-so, which is fine. Wish I had it. The degrees. But is it so that divine healing should be carried on in the church just like the apostles did? Oh, no, no. He's sinning. He's an unbeliever. Right? You say, do you believe we receive the Holy Ghost like they did here? I was reading over the Bible here at Acts 2, where it said they poured out the Holy Ghost and they staggered like they were drunk and they went out there and talked in the languages of those people and things like that. Acted like people are drunk. The church thought they were drunk. When we receive the Holy Ghost in the Baptist church, our Baptist, our Methodist, our Presbyterian, whatever it might be, do, uh, I don't see us doing that. Well, I'll tell you, child, that was just for them 12. He's a sinning. He is not born to the Spirit of God because the Bible said, He that is born to the Spirit of God does not disbelieve. Amen. He's a believer. Amen. And he cannot. Why? Why? Oh, here it is. Amen. The dove is in him. Lead him. For the Spirit of God is in him and he cannot deny it. Amen. He cannot. If it's the Spirit of God, God won't deny His own Word. Amen. If I deny my own Word, then I become a liar. And if, the, and if you say you got the Spirit of God and deny the Word of God, it's either God a liar or you a liar. It's one or the other. And the Bible said, let every man's Word be a lie and mine be the truth. And a man that's born to the Spirit of God cannot disagree with God's Word. He's got to say it's a right. Amen. He cannot do nothing else. This is, this is the truth. Amen. Listen, let me read this again. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin for the seed. What is the seed of God? The promise Abraham had the seed to the seed. What is the seed now? Christ. Is Christ the seed of God? Amen. Whose seed is if he isn't? Or, or he's the seed of God. The seed of God remaineth in him. The Holy Ghost comes to abide. Not from meeting to meeting, but for eternal. Now, you know, put down your scripture for this, Ephesians 4.30. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed until the day of your redemption. Amen. The seed of God remains in him, and he cannot sin because he's born of God. Hallelujah. He can't disbelieve God's Praise word. The name of God. Now, when you see a man disagreeing with God's word, 
And said, oh, that was for another age. When the promise is to whosoever will let him come. Just remember, he is a unbeliever and he's not of God. Yeah. We better stop here, haven't we? What time is it? Oh, my. I got, I, I just, I don't want to get back here Sunday. Let me get these, it's re, real fast, can I? It's just so good. Don't you think it's good? Oh, the word of God. All right. Brother Bram, what must a person do? Let me hold that for the last. Get this here. What uh, likeness will we be in the resurrection as we were when we went down? Exactly. Resurrection. Just, just think of this. This book falls to the floor. And I take this book, a different book, and replace it. That isn't resurrection. Resurrection is bring up the same one that went down. Was Jesus resurrected? Did they know him? Was he standing with them, the same Jesus? Amen. And this same Jesus Amen. that was taken up Amen. will come again in like manner as you see him go. Amen. The resurrection Amen. is just like when you die, that's how you rise up. You die as a human in flesh, you rise as a human in flesh. That's just exactly. Amen. So the resurrection is just the same. We could stand another two hours on it, but we better not get started. Explain Hebrews 4 and 6. Right quick now, we get this just real quick. And compare it to Hebrews 10, 26. Hebrews 6 and 4, I beg your pardon. 6 and 4 and 10 and 26. Let's see, 10, 26, all right. I got them right here. See? For it is impossible for those that were once enlightened, have tasted the heavenly gifts, and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. And having tasted the good word of God, the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall to renew themselves again into repentance, and they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh, put him to an open shame. Now go right ahead and tell what it is. Now look, I had that till the night. How many were sure when I explained that? All right. You know what it is then? See, it's them borderline believers. How many read back in Deuteronomy 1 there where the spies went right in there and tasted of the things from Canaan? Which Canaan is not a type of the millennium. How many knows that? You mean just one hand, Junie? That's right. Canaan is not the type of the millennium because he had wars, fightings, killings, and everything else in Canaan. Type, the holy, Canaan is the type of the Holy Ghost. Egypt is the world that they come out of. The wilderness is where they were a sanctified, called out church. Canaan is where they settled down with the Holy Spirit. Because they still had wars. And if you don't believe... You have wars, just get the Holy Spirit one. What are you doing? What are you doing, Canaan? They were possessing their rights. Lord, they were possessing their rights. And they could not possess their rights till they got into Canaan. They didn't own nothing in the wilderness. And when they come into Canaan, then they had rights. We've got rights when you receive the Holy Ghost, you're in Canaan. You have to fight for it. Every inch of ground you have to fight for. Yes, yeah. yeah, sir. That's the reason people say, Brother Brown, you pray for me today. I don't see. Get over in Canaan once, brother. You realize where you belong. Watch prayer start being turned around. Hey. Yes, sir. He said, look at here, Satan. This is mine. I'm possessor of this. God said so. Amen. Move out. That's right. Amen. That's right. Move off my grounds. Your ground, Satan, say, I got an abstract deed to it. Amen. Move out. You know, I'll serve notice on you by the Holy Spirit's guidance. <laughs> he moves out. Sure he has to. Now, now they just tasted the heavenly gifts. Now watch over here. If we sin willfully, tenth, uh, this is 26th of the 10th chapter. If we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. Now, one of them is where you just tasted of it, and the next is where you have received it and got knowledge of it. Then if you sin, what? Disbelieve. Now, watch how they both read, see. If you disbelieve willfully, after you receive the knowledge of the truth. Now, just a minute. Let me get here. If we shall fall away to renew ourselves, it is impossible for those which were once enlightened and have tasted of the good heavenly gifts, tasted of them, see, and we're made partakers see, of the Holy Spirit. And have tasted of the good word. 
of God and empowers the world to come. And then he goes on down here and says that if you set right in like the briars, as the rain cometh off upon the earth, if you set in like the briars, the Holy Spirit fell. And, oh my, you enjoyed as much as the rest of them. But as far as putting your hand to it or going on out and working for the Lord and doing something about it, no, nah, no, nah, you can't do that. See, then that shows the Spirit of God's not in you. See. And you just finally wind yourself out whose end is to be burned. But over here, if we disbelieve... Now, what is sin? Unbelief. If the thing has been made known to you and you turn away from it willfully and say, I, I don't want nothing to do with it. And if you've done seen it, it'll never call to your heart again. You're finished. That's right. You have, you have sinned away your day of grace. See, for if we disbelieve willfully, now in my Bible, I've got it marked here where it's uh, the, the M, the, the Marjorie reading here, says sin, unbelief, willfully. See, see, willfully, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. If you walk away and turn God down willfully after it's all been made good to you and God's offered it to you, See, but a certain fearful looking for the judgment, the fiery indignation which shall devour the adversary. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. How much more sore punishment suppose ye shall be though worthy who has trod underfoot the Son of God and has counted the covenant worthy to sanctify an unholy thing and done despite to the works of grace. Oh my. What would it be? A preacher. A minister, let's just take, because I'm a preacher, let's say it's a preacher, he walks up here, he comes up and confesses Christ, gets his life cleaned up where he don't live uh, adulteries and things anymore, living a good, clean life, walks up here, the grace of God's been good to him, then he walks right up into the knowledge of the Holy Ghost, see, walks up, God leads him right up to the knowledge of the Holy Ghost, and there he sees it, but he said, now wait a minute, my church wouldn't stand for that. Mm -mm. I couldn't do that. They'd turn me out. The, the council would turn me out. The next ministerial meeting, I'd be excommunicated. There remaineth no more sacrifice for sin because he's tucked the very blood that sanctified him and brought him this far to the knowledge of the truth and counted it as though it was an unworthy thing and trotted it under his feet after the God has led him step by step up here to the Holy Ghost. She said, oh, now, wait a minute, Brother Brown. Just a minute. The Spirit of Antichrist will do that. Did you notice the two heads of them? Who are Judas Iscariot? The devil. Amen. The Bible said he was the son of perdition. What is perdition? Hell. Amen. He's the son of hell. Come from hell and went to hell. Jesus Christ was the son of God. Came from heaven and returned to heaven. Amen. When they both died at the, on the crosses. G, did you know Judas died on a cross? How many knows that? He died on a tree. Jesus died on a tree too. He just cut. That's all. Cursed he had died on a tree. And he come from hell. And watch what, as far as he could sneak his way into the church, that's as high as he can come now. See how deceiving he could be? Now Judas come, what was he? A treasure. A brother. Working in the church. The treasure in the church. Walked out on up, believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, and was justified.